Thank you all so much. And thanks, Nick. I, I really appreciate the warm intro. Um, thank you all for being here. Thanks to uh, Rob Moonen and Trish Gohorst from BC Forest Safety Council for inviting me here. And um, thanks to all the members of TAG. Um, we've done a lot of work together, and we're continuing to do more work with Fatigue Science and, and the TAG group. So I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about um, some, some science and some new technology that you know, really when it comes down to it, we hope uh, that with the work with TAG and with BC Forest uh, Safety Council that it, it can really continue to make a difference in one of the most critical areas that uh, really affects safety in, in the forestry industry, which of course is, is fatigue. So I have a presentation here, but I'd, I'd love to make this you know, fairly interactive. I'll hopefully have you know, maybe five, 10 minutes for questions at the end. And if anything comes up during, <clears throat> that you'd like to ask, you know, just keep it in mind because I, I really do love kind of answering questions and, and making sure that this is, um, as, as Nick mentioned at the start, you know, things that are, that are tangible and practical that can actually affect, um, you know, real world safety behavior. I actually, Nick, really appreciated the use of the term choices at the start of your presentation and behavioral change. You know, one of the things in the world of, of fatigue management is, you oftentimes you'll hear these presentations and they'll go on and on about the in-depth science and fatigue does this and this statistic and that statistic. We're, we're really very much more about you know, how can we understand a few very tangible practical things that at the end of the day are worth hopefully listening to because they can make a concrete difference. And um, so if any point during this presentation I seem to be veering off of that mission, uh, you know, let me know. I'm sure I'll see, see your faces. But, uh, yeah, that, that, is, that is the goal. So I appreciate, uh, once again, the opportunity to, to share this with you. I'm just going to put my, my phone up here to make it a little lighter. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, fatigue science. Um, you know, there's, there's a slide up here that basically says we're a company that's worked with uh, industries and elite performance companies to manage fatigue. But I really figured instead of talking through names or logos or background that I just give you kind of a, a bit of our, our founding story. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a sad story. It's a story related to a, a fatigue-related accident. Our, our co-founder, Pat Byrne, uh, was actually working uh, here in BC with, with WorkSafe. And he got a call one night that his nephew, who was in, in heavy industry, was coming home from a work site around 3 in the morning and you know, veered off the road into a fatigue-related accident and died. And this was in the early you know, to mid-2000s. And you know, back then, there weren't you know, wearable technology. There wasn't mobile apps. There wasn't all these platforms that can make a difference. But there was a lot of science. There was a lot of studying of fatigue out there. And so Pat Byrne actually had the idea that you know, one day, looking to the future, this science that can actually you know, predict and quantify fatigue and help guide people to be aware of fatigue and reduce it ultimately um, is science that ultimately could make its way eventually into a set of products, services, and insights that could help prevent that sort of tragic accident from happening again. And you know, 10, 15 years later, um, that's been our mission ever since. And, and again, that's why it's um, really meaningful that you all are here today to, you know, Hear me rattle on for a little bit about uh, a little bit about the science and a little bit about practical uh, measures that that result from it. So um, <clears throat> there were a lot of great stats that that came out of Corey's presentation, and again, I want to thank uh, Corey as well for a great presentation. I don't want to belabor too many of these um, here because you've you've heard so many, but you know even the statistics that uh, Corey mentioned, a, a lot of those cases had to do with fatigue. For instance, you know. Even, and this was not planned to have this also up here, but the BC Texas City refinery accident was partially fatigue related as one of those causes of human error. And if you were to go back you know, 15, 20 years, <coughs> excuse me, and look at the stats around um, fatigue related accidents, you would see stats that say 5%, 10% of accidents are fatigue related, 15%. Every year that a new safety agency or a new private industry comes up with a new study, that number goes up and up and up. And it varies by industry, but you know, the, the National Transportation Safety Bureau in the middle said up to 40% of transportation accidents are fatigue-related. So it's, it's definitely a big concern. 
And you know, while this is uh, from a, a tram driver in, in London who got in an accident, I'm sure this probably resonates um, with many in forestry as well, which is you know, the, the unnamed former tram driver that was involved in the accident was quoted as saying, no one is ever fully awake. I was always in a bit of a daze, and that's because in large part of the shift patterns, it's tough to get good sleep. And, and from working with Trish and the BC Forest Safety Council, we certainly have, have heard a similar message about you know, the conditions, that it's, it's a really demanding job. And so uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to, um, to talk through this a bit. So you know, this is one of, my, one of my favorite points. It's the most basic point. Fatigue is such an obvious thing, but it's also something that I think is, is really hard to put a finger on. If you ask someone, what's the difference between just feeling tired and actually being fatigued? It starts to sound like we're all talking about the same thing, fatigued, being tired. But in reality, fatigue isn't just being tired. Fatigue is a specific physiological condition, and it has a couple of concrete effects that oftentimes are different than what you perceive as you know, yawning or you know, feeling drowsy. <clears throat> and we'll get into a few of what those are, but one of the most subtle points is it's not just about sleep. You can be a fantastic sleeper, a good sleeper, an OK sleeper, and you can still face critical levels of fatigue simply by working outside of daylight hours. You know, a lot of people think, oh, I'm working a night shift, but I've been working the night shift for a few days in a row. You know, I'm sure I'm adjusted to it by now if I'm a good sleeper. Not true. The body fundamentally has um, <clears throat> circadian rhythms that are trained for daytime alertness. And so we'll get into what that looks like and how managing fatigue on night shifts is a particular area of interest as well. One of the things that you may have heard, um, but some find quite surprising, is that fatigue's effects actually have similar physiological impacts as alcohol. Now, you know, we might often talk about there's a number of, of effects from fatigue, there's a number of effects from alcohol. You know, for instance, fatigue can make you yawn, alcohol can make you tell crazy stories. But neither of those two things impact safety. There, there is an overlap, though, in things like reaction time and micro sleeps that actually have a similarity or an overlap between those two. So these are the effects that a lot of people feel when they say, I feel tired. They'll talk about you know, their mood changing, increased irritability, fluctuations, you know, sometimes using a lot of caffeine. Um, but there's also cognitive effects. You know, they've actually done a lot of scientific tests on decision making where you know, they have objective ways of looking at the ability to communicate or give a certain instruction or respond. And there's objective ways of, of quantifying fatigue's impacts on those critical safety factors. And then of course there's the you know, real fancy word somatic effects which really just means you know, when it actually impacts things going on physically in the body. So the tendency for micro sleeps, reaction time, other things where that cognitive fatigue in your mind translates into something physical on the road or on the work site. So in short, not to belabor the point anymore, but health, safety, and performance um, are all impacted by fatigue. And the real question is, you know, we probably all know that to some extent, but how can you know, the, the fancy studying of sleep and the, and the science of sleep and fatigue really make a tangible difference. And, and that's, that's what hopefully in the next half hour or so uh, we'll provide some, some keen insights on. So this was the same question. How can the science of sleep make a difference that the US Army Research Lab actually spent over 25 years trying to research an answer? And one of the things about the US Army Research Lab is that they built this research into a model. It was actually a model that was built to do one really simple thing, which is if you could supply it with all the relevant sleep data that you have, it would spit out the other end an objective assessment of how fatigued someone is. And the US Army had an obvious interest in doing this because they cared about soldiers who face very similar conditions to you know, the conditions a lot of you and your workers face. You know, shift work, 24-hour conditions, compressed periods of sleeping. And this model was really helping the US Army optimize the safety of their soldiers. But this was also the model that obviously had so many implications beyond just soldiers. It would, it would, kind, of, it would kind of be very limiting to keep that model in the lab. And so 
In the late 2000s, Fatigue Science, um, our company, acquired the rights to this model from the US Army to say, let's take it out of the lab and let's, let's use that in a real concrete sense to help the millions of people in heavy industry that are facing the same very real concerns. So, you know, what did the research actually find that's important? You've probably heard a lot of talk about, oh, there's so many things going on with sleep. Is it REM sleep? Is it deep sleep? Do I need a lot of sleep? Do I need all this? In reality, it boiled down to about six pretty simple things, which is when you're thinking about how sleep affects fatigue, on the left-hand side there, you see things that actually relate to the sleep obtained. Yes, the amount of sleep you get is important, um, but also the quality of sleep impacts it as well. It's not just, did I get seven hours or did I not get seven hours? The third thing that's probably the most ignored is that you know, even seven hours of high quality sleep doesn't have the same effect if you're getting it at very inconsistent times from night to night, or if you're getting it always at night or always in the day. Your circadian rhythm interacts with the entire cumulative history of the sleep that you've obtained, not just last night's sleep, and not just did I get seven hours. So that's one of the biggest you know, misconceptions that people have is, yeah, I got seven hours last night. I'm, I'm great for the day ahead. You know, we have this uh, kind of funny saying in, in, um, at, at Fatigue Science, which is, you know, better sleep doesn't happen overnight, um, which, is, which is obviously a joke. But when we ask people to explain what they think the joke means, you get kind of three different answers, which is kind of funny. So some people say, you know, what you mean by that is that it's all the preparations I do during the day, you know, the, the nutrition I take in, the sleep hygiene, when I drink caffeine. So it's during the day, it's not overnight. And, and they're right. Um, other people say that it's, oh, I see what you mean. It's not just one night. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens in two nights, three nights, the whole week. And they're right as well. That's a secondary meaning. And then, of course, the third meaning is when you're doing 24-7 shift work, often you're sleeping in the day. So great sleep happens during the day, not overnight. So all of those are true. And all of those have a really complicated um, cumulative impact. Cumulative is really the key word that we come up with over and over again when we look at ways to actually reduce the problem. It's not just about last night's sleep. So what does good sleep look like if we're looking at an entire week of sleep? For the vast majority of the population, you want seven or more hours of sleep. A few people can get by with less than this, but most people actually, even if they think they can, really require seven or more hours of sleep. Um, in addition to that, it's really about the quality of sleep. And you know, we don't have to go too deep and say, oh, it's about REM sleep or this sleep. The, the science is actually always improving in terms of how to incorporate those complex elements. But what's true today and what's really known and statistically proven today is that if you're losing a lot of time between when you fall asleep and when you ultimately get out of bed in the morning, that counts. That, that's as good as, as not sleeping during those minutes. So we like to think about quality in terms of the percent of that time between when you fall asleep and when you wake up that you're actually sleeping. And, and as we'll get into, uh, a lot of people are really surprised when they you know, use a tool, whether it's ours or another tool, and, and see um, that they actually don't sleep nearly as much as they're thinking of sleeping. And finally, consistency, not to harp on that, but it's definitely not possible in shift work, but in an ideal world and just to be aware of, sleeping within the same 30-minute window, falling asleep within that same window is, is another key element there. So as I mentioned, the US Army built this model called the safety alertness model. And, and what it does is it really tries to do, take all the guesswork out of that. You know, we just talked about six different factors, time of day, quality, quantity, consistency, circadian rhythm, so many different factors that could impact your fatigue at any given moment. And, and to top it all off, if you're trying to assess your own fatigue, what's worse is the more fatigued you are, um, statistically it's been shown the less likely you are to really have a clear sense of how fatigued you actually are. So the model's whole purpose is to you know, take objective sleep data and pump it into this model. And then it'll pump out a prediction of what level of fatigue you're actually at in terms that are ultimately relevant to real world safety outcomes. So as an example, if I were at the score of 70, that roughly means that my reaction time is 43% slower than if I was not in a fatigue impaired state. If I was in the green at the top versus if I was at a 70, 
my reaction time would be about 43% slower. It might not sound like a lot, but as, as all of you probably know, by you know, driving 100 kilometers an hour down the highway and needing to brake suddenly, you can travel the length of a football field pretty quickly in just the span of a few seconds, you know, if you're really trying to hit the brakes and respond to something. So that little bit can make a huge difference. Um, similarly, you know, lapse index. What is lapse index? It's vaguely related to your tendency for micro sleeps or falling asleep, dozing off, nodding off, and then waking back up. So, you know, at a score of 70, that's roughly the same impact as at a BAC of 0 0.08 of two drinks of alcohol. But the crazy thing is, is that unlike alcohol, which is avoidable on, on um, shifts, you know, it's actually, if you're doing a night shift, it's just part of the job, and that's one of the scary but real things about 24-7 operations. Most people will dip below 70, even good sleepers, at some point during a night shift. So we'll give you a couple of examples of, um, of what that means in a bit. But um, you know, this, this model, just to, not to harp on it, it's been studied by the US Department of Transportation, Federal Aviation Administration, and others, and it really does have an impact. So, you know, those agencies found, this one in particular, USDOT, found that when you're in the red there, really deep in the red, below 70, below 60, you've got a much higher likelihood of getting into an accident. And the accidents you do get into are much more severe than the ones you've got into if you have perfect alertness to try to make the accident less severe or to avoid it altogether. Uh, with some volunteers, we also did our own studies and found very similar things on the road. So if you're in the red here in the 50s or 60s, you're up to nine times more likely to excessively speed and up to four times more likely to brake harshly. So it's not, to, it's not to harp on any one statistic or another. All it's really to say is there's a lot of research that's been done and you definitely wanna to try to minimize your time in the red and try to do everything you can to get more into the green. And so this, this way of looking at quantifying fatigue um, is something that's, that's really exciting for us because it, it takes what previously is just an invisible kind of sense or sort of an intuition that I'm tired and makes it a lot more real, a lot more tangible. So, you know, the real question here is, you know, we talked about time of day and your body clock and circadian rhythm, but I'll give you just a couple of real specific examples. So, if I'm doing a day shift and I'm a completely, let's say, decently good sleeper, uh, probably a better sleeper than me, I'm not actually a great sleeper, um, and you're working, let's say, between 9 a.m. and 8 p.m. driving, this is pretty typical for what you'd see for most drivers. Um, you know, they'd, they'd fluctuate up and down in the, the light green and the dark green, the 80s and the 90s. You might see some drivers in the yellow, but, you know, during the day, it's very typical that your circadian rhythm is just going to make you fluctuate a little. But what about at night? So this is a reasonably healthy sleeper. They've been doing night shifts for a few nights in a row, and it's really hitting them pretty hard despite being a pretty good sleeper. And this is what I mean. You know, on night shifts, most sleepers, even good ones, will dip a little bit below 70 at some point during their shift. And the best you can do in that case, if you are an ideal sleeper, is just to be aware of that and to be extra cautious. There are ways to reduce it and to spend less time there, but the number one thing is just awareness. So, you know, a lot of organizations try to say, oh, if we can quantify what percent of time people are spending in various states, you know, in the orange, in the red, in the yellow, then we can actually track, are we getting better? Are we reducing fatigue over time? Now, these numbers are just an example. These are not by any means, you know, rules or anything. It's just to show in some cases, you know, some organizations will say, we want to try to reduce fatigue down to 0% of hours on duty during day shift. Um, but even they'll recognize during night shift, that's pretty much impossible. You want to try to get it you know, fairly, fairly minimal. Uh, we did a study with BC Forest Safety Council um, with some volunteers. And what we found was you know, the rates in forestry were about three times higher than in any of our other comparable industries, mining, construction, transportation, um, what was interesting about that was three times more fatigue in day versus night. And we, we really dug into why, and, and we'll get into a couple of the reasons in a bit, but one of the critical things was, 
You know, in logging, a lot of workers have very uncertain or variable schedules. You know, I'm supposed to start at step seven, but will there be a backup at the station? You know, will it actually be eight or nine? So that variability leads to people actually giving themselves even less sleep opportunity. So, you know, when it comes to organizations trying to do something um, tangibly about changing their, uh, their risk, they'll really just think about it this way, where they'll start with a small study typically, and they'll have volunteers, you know, put on a ready band and we'll quantify the percent of time all these volunteers spend in various states. And then we'll combine it all together and each organization will get their own kind of pie chart that you see there, which is kind of a way of saying, okay, so today I'm spending, you know, 9% of my time in the orange and 11% in the, in the red. Can we do things, and this is getting back to, to Nick's point about bringing it back to practical, tangible things. Can we do things to take that orange and red slice of the pie and you know, actually make it smaller? That's really the name of the game, and it's a really good way of seeing, is whatever we're doing actually working, or are we just spinning our wheels, feeling like we're talking about safety benefits without actually seeing a difference? So quantifying fatigue is, is one of the first steps um, to reducing it, but obviously the key question isn't just can we quantify it, it's um, you know, how can we actually reduce it. So um, the next half of the presentation, and I'll, I really do want to make sure I leave time for questions toward the end, so I might speed through a little bit of this, but the next, time we'll give, the next section will give you a little bit of guidance as to how um, members of TAG um, and uh, members with the BC Forest Safety Council are really approaching kind of a novel and, and modern approach to using data to actually help reduce that, that fatigue on duty. So how, how can it be done? Well, addressing fatigue on duty really comes down to two fundamental strategies. And it really starts with understanding the two fundamental root causes of fatigue. So on the left here, we have what we call inherent fatigue risk for an organization which is really to say if you had ideal sleepers or perfect sleepers that just had really tough schedules, you know, there's still going to be fatigue exposure. And you know, the only way to improve from X percent down to something lower is to try to figure out if we can make schedules better. Make schedules better for workers to get better sleep opportunity and to be less exposed to those critical points of risk. Um, Trish from BC Forest Safety Council has been really instrumental in pushing us to do a, a whole bunch of analysis for some concrete changes there that we'll talk about in a second, at least as far as ideas for potential changes go. But the second area, and the area that's sometimes easier or more, you know, more concrete to do, and, and I wanna, on this front I want to thank both, both Trish and um, all the members of TAG, and particularly Ken Peterson, who's been one of the, those that has been spearheading this initiative, really ways to help workers get better sleep because that excess, the difference between the inherent risk and the total risk that's available is all due to people not getting as good sleep as they can. So briefly, let's talk about each of these two, better schedules and better sleep. Better schedules I think you'll find really interesting, but again, it's very specific to individual operations. So my hope is what you'll take away from better schedules is um, just some, some insights that when you get thinking about your own organization, you could think, hmm, maybe that's an interesting way of looking at it. Maybe we could do some analysis to specific to our own use case. Even with the work with BC Forest, we found you know, there's a lot of really powerful insights here. And then there's some constraints that are just the, the way of the world or the way of you know, schedules work that make it difficult to implement all of this. So the key here is some interesting things and then thinking about which of those can I take away and which of those would need to be refined more for my organization. So briefly, uh, four areas. One, just a comment on variability. We heard so much in the work that we did from BC Forest Safety Council that the constant variability, whether it's actually I'm starting at 7 p.m. one night and then I'm starting at another time another night, or more likely if it's I'm starting at 7 p.m., but is it really going to be 7 p.m., or is it actually going to be 9 p.m., and I don't really know when I'm going to get back. That variability takes what's already pretty high risk on night shift and often makes it higher because it, it's harder for people to plan adequately when they're going to go to bed and when to wake up. And the lack of the ability to plan really is one thing that leads to less sleep. Um, so for now, um, tr doing anything we can to try to reduce that variability um, is a really key aspect to reducing risk. 
The second thing here is to be aware of the, the various hotspots. And what I mean by that is, with uh, BC Fire Safety Council, we modeled what a good sleeper who is really struggling despite sleeping well because they're on the 10th night of their night shift, um, you know, 10th night of their, of their five week rotation of night shifts. We modeled when would they face um, a really severe period of fatigue risk, you know, below 70. And we found that if they were starting at 7 p.m. and they were still a great sleeper, it would come into play right around 2, 3 a.m. and really extend for the rest of the period, 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m. But what happens if I'm starting work as a good sleeper just two hours later at 9 p.m.? That critical period gets bigger. It's about five hours that it gets really large in terms of that critical period. And if I'm one of the unlucky people who doesn't get to start the actual shift or get to their station until 11 PM, it's practically their entire shift that is spent there. That's the impact of circadian rhythm, where your body is just trained to being awake. So what we've actually done um, with BC Forest Safety Council is actually built some diagrams of these things for people to look at prior to starting their own shift to say, wow, at least I can be aware of that risk um, before I go into work. I can be more cautious of the likely risks. And bearing in mind that most people are not ideal sleepers, so it's actually going to be even worse than that. So the third area is something really interesting, which is you know, a lot of people think about, you know, if I'm doing five weeks of night shift in a row, is, are all the risks going to be the same? And what we actually found was the hardest periods to adjust are those days that we've circled there in red, the third, fourth, and fifth day in the first week, and the, um, the ninth and tenth day in the second week. And those are the days when you can see the average score. So if we go back, you know, we look at each score, and some of the scores are in the green, some of the scores are in the orange and the red, but the average score is probably somewhere right in the middle in the yellow area. Well, the average score was actually way worse during those red periods there, the, those specific nights. So we asked and we modeled, if hypothetically we could give people a little more time to rest on those critical first two weeks, if we could take those harshest couple of hours, the 5 a.m.s, the 6 a.m.s, and give them those hours back to sleep, um, what would that look like? And you can see in blue there, that would actually project a substantial improvement just by giving two hours back in terms of fatigue exposure. Now, one of the key insights is that's not always possible. Sometimes you've got to drive to a station and back, and you need the full you know, 10 to 12 hours. But to the extent that it is possible, it's one thing that at least gives some ideas for you know, maybe something that's more specific to your own specific schedule constraints. And in this example, from an inherent risk perspective, it was projected to make a pretty substantial difference, taking inherent risk from 16% down to 10% um, if, if implemented, and again, if people had ideal sleep. So fourth and finally, considering alternate rotations. Um, so we've been talking about five nights on, two nights off, and that's fairly common. But um, you know, we decided just for, the, just for the sake of a hypothetical question, what if we modeled some other crazy rotations? What if we modeled two nights on, one night off in repetition? Not that we would actually do this, but would that substantially give people that day off consistently to recover better? And, and fortunately, as you might expect, it, it did not actually produce substantially better benefits than the 5N20 rotation. Um, but it's interesting to get thinking that way. What could I do differently? Could I add another rest day? Could I not? And with the model, we're actually able to project and predict these changes uh, specific to operations. So in summary on scheduling, there's a lot of cool, fascinating things you can do with modeling. Um, the most important thing is to be aware that it's possible and to make individuals aware of the risks that they're likely to encounter. So um, better sleep. This is, this is the part that, um, that gets, I think, a lot, more ex a lot more exciting for those who don't feel like scheduling is um, something that they can personally do. Um, and on this front, I, I want to mention that a lot of this is generally applicable, whether you use fatigue science products like the ReadyBand or not. Um, some of this touches on the use of the ReadyBand, um, because thanks to the tag, um, tag group itself, um, there will be about 200 ready bands that are being deployed to, to workers that are members of the, the tag group licensees. So uh, with that in mind, we'll give you kind of a glimpse of what they're doing to adopt new technology to ultimately help people get better sleep, um, which, is, which is really kind of a key part of this. So 
Getting better sleep, as you probably know, is, is not a one-size-fits-all situation. Um, but a lot of people are pretty surprised by, by the statistics. You know, most people think, OK, I've either got, I'm one of those people that's got some uh, far out sleep disorder, or I'm a normal sleeper who doesn't need to do anything different. The statistics actually suggest something pretty substantially different, which is, you know, in a group of 100 people, we've got, you know, close to 200 people here, but let's just say it was 100 people in this room. You know, as you can see on the top left, only about 10 people would be nearly optimized. About 10% of people would have such good sleep habits that, you know, really all they need to do is be aware of their risks, um, you know, the night shift risks, et cetera. Most people fall into that middle category where they actually have a substantial and meaningful opportunity to make small little changes that have a really big impact. And, and the reason for that is because most people say, ah, what's, what's 10 extra minutes of sleep going to get me? Or what's one less interruption in the night going to get me? It's not going to make a difference in my life. But again, sleep is cumulative. And it's all about that science of sleep adding up, where those small little changes can make a much bigger difference. Maybe not in the way you feel, sometimes yes, sometimes no, but ultimately in the things that matter to safety, the reaction time and the likelihood of falling into a micro sleep. And then there's typically in the population at large, about 15% of the population that actually has a likely sleep disorder. Um, but if you guess how many people in a population are actually diagnosed and treated and you know, actually treat that condition, today it's about 1%. So there's a huge epidemic of sleep disorders that most people don't even know that they have. Um, and we were talking with members of the BC Forest Safety Council, and you know, it's likely that within the trucking community, based on what we've learned, um, that this number could even be as high as double. Up to 30% of people, um, from some indications, could have a meaningful sleep abnormality. So it's, not, it's worthy thinking about what category am I likely in. Most people will still probably be in the yellow. But the key thing is that there's different strategies for people um, that have different conditions. So again, if you're most people, the number one thing you can do is optimize your sleep habits in small, often boring, but really substantial ways if you actually have a tool to measure the impact on your fatigue. Um, if you're nearly optimized, you know, try to use a tool, whether it's a printout on the wall or whether it's you know, the ReadyBand app that we'll talk about in a bit, to be aware of specific unexpected risks that you might face on a night shift or after a couple of days of bad sleep. And if your sleep does appear really, really bad, the number one thing you can do is to seek a formal sleep consultation and then go down a path leading to treatment. Um, ReadyBand won't diagnose you. Um, it's not a medical tool. But it will help you see if your sleep is improving over time if you do um, get your help in that regard. So I'll talk to you a little bit about the ReadyBand, but I'll try to just do it in the context of what the TAG group is, is working on. I'll try to not make it look like a sales pitch. Some might see it as, oh, that's a fancy graphic. The real intent is just to give you a little insight into the work um, that we're doing with the TAG group and BC Forest Safety Council. So ReadyBand is the thing I have on my wrist here. It's like a watch. Um, it, it tracks your sleep. But more importantly, it uses that safety model that we talked about um, to actually help every different type of sleeper manage their fatigue risk on a daily basis. So I won't go into too much depth, but you know, as, you, as we mentioned, you know, there's three things you can do. Optimize your sleep habits, be aware of your risks, and track your progress. There's, uh, there's tools inside the ReadyBand app for each and every one of those use cases. And, and it's actually pretty fun. So that's, 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 the, that's the most salesy I'll get, is to say that it's fun. But um, a lot of people do kind of uh, you know, lo love to check their ReadyBand app every morning and see how they're doing. Did I meet my goal? Did I not? So just to give you a little bit of insight into what, um, you know, the, what the TAG group is starting to roll out with, uh, with 200 um, workers is, um, oops, let me just back up there a bit. So with sleep habit optimization, it's all about better habits, better sleep, less fatigue. And these are the three key areas that the app helps you really focus on. So sleep planning, sleep hygiene, and sleep environment. So what do we mean by this? Well, sleep planning is, uh, is probably my, my most favorite of these. So one of the most basic things that most people forget to do or, or do somewhat incorrectly is they'll say, OK, I've got to get up at 7. Uh, that means that if I want seven hours of sleep, I've got to be asleep by noon. Noon to seven is seven hours. That's seven hours. That's what I'm going to do. 
But in reality, one of the biggest uh, missed factors is that people underestimate the impact of the time that's lost due to these awakenings. Awakenings are this very insidious thing because you might remember waking up once in the night to, to go to the washroom or you just woke up for a few minutes. Most awakenings are subconscious. You don't actually remember them. So what awakenings are are things that rob you of quality time of sleep. And if you have um, seven hours that you want to get, and you're losing half an hour every night, then it becomes a lot more complicated to say, OK, I've got to get up at 6.45, and I need to subtract seven hours, and then I need to subtract another 30 minutes after that. And you know, people aren't going to do that every single night. So in the new version of our, of our app that's going to be rolled out to the, the tag drivers, um, it really just does all the math for you and sets an alarm. The other things are a lot of sleep hygiene tips, which is all the stuff you can do while awake that can really help you uh, while you're um, asleep. You know, simple tips, but seeing these tips consistently enough, um, things like avoiding late day caffeine, drinking enough water during the day so you don't drink a lot of water at night and then wake up, other habits like digital screen use, they're all very relevant. And, and the new app will actually kind of spoon feed one or two of these um, ideas every once in a while to help. Similarly for sleep environment, there's a number of things you can do to control light, sound, and temperature. Um, that are really, again, you know, people shrug and say, oh, that's just a bunch of friendly advice. I've seen it on a wall before. But when you can ultimately see the impact of it on your fatigue improving day after day, it can really help motivate wanting to get a higher fatigue score. And so you know, what a lot of drivers do when they wake up in the morning or right before their shift is they'll just take a peek to see, OK, is my fatigue level normal? What's it going to be six hours from now? What's it going to be 12 hours from now? and um, ultimately tracking their progress. That's where it gets really rewarding. So you wake up every day, and you see, did I get a score that's better than yesterday? Um, and did I hit my goal? So if my goal was 80 and I got 84, then I, I'm feeling a lot better. It really keeps me motivated to take these small, simple steps every day that I can see materially make me safer and healthier on the job. And of course, you can look at it over longer term trends as well. And you can see all your rich sleep history there, which really, again, gets you motivated. When you can start to see a picture of your sleep, it really says, yeah, I actually want to see you know, a more solid yellow bar. I don't really want to see that awakening or that awakening throughout the night. So um, you know, ultimately, it's, it's something that we feel really encouraged by. Even with the, the earlier version of our product that didn't have a lot of this um, new tools involved, it's really had a huge impact, helping people materially reduce the percent of time spent on fatigue related and um, uh, uh, while fatigue impaired on duty. And we hope with even the new version, with a lot of these features um, actually coming out um, very shortly, they're going to be continually updated, that we can get this number even, even higher, which is, is really key there. So, um, with that in mind, I'll, um, I know we're running out of time, so I'll just skip right to, um, right to questions um, if there's any few questions in the last couple of minutes. But I will mention um, the members of the TAG licensees. Um, thanks to uh, your commitment on this front, um, there are 200 ready beds available for anyone working as a member of the TAG licensee group. Um, I've got just a few on hand today, so come on up afterwards and happy to, to give you one. Uh, we'll just have you sign a sign-in sheet. And um, from there, if others are interested as well, um, Trish from the BC Forest Safety Council right over there um, can definitely talk to you about um, that as well. We have a sort of partnership with them in that regard. Um, well, thank you all. Sorry to breeze through the last little bit of it. Um, I think we might have just a minute or two for questions if we do. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll... So I have a question. Yeah, absolutely. Have you found in the studies that show the difference between age groups, gender? Great, great question. So the question really breaks down into two parts. Age groups and gender, do they have an impact? Um, as far as the scientific modeling goes, the modeling actually suggests that it's generally valid to predict one's fatigue level for the adults in the range of 18 to 65. Separately from predicting one's level and using the right calibration, um, older people um, generally have worse sleep. Men generally have worse sleep. And generally, there is a correlation between um, one's, one's weight or physical fitness and sleep as well. And so, it's a really difficult subject in, in the forestry industry. You know, we talk about schedules being one of the very factors that causes it. Um, but a lot of those other demographic factors certainly come into play as well um, within the forest industry. So I'll just jump in. Just one more question. Sorry, Mike. Let me just, uh, 
um, power drinks, energy drinks. I mean, uh, I know a lot of young people think, hey, I'm okay because I'm going to drink my Red Bull at coffee break and I'll be fine after it. What, what That's a fantastic question. Caffeine, what is its impact? Um, caffeine can have a positive short-term impact, and we mean really short-term, an hour or two, um, where it can improve something. So if you are trying to manage an hour or two, caffeine intake in a targeted sense can be a tool. But there's a specific downside to that, which is that if that comes at the cost of you being more fatigued the next day because your sleep was disturbed with the caffeine coming too close to your sleeping time, it can actually have the adverse effect. So we don't really have one definitive piece of guidance there other than just to really think about caffeine as, as not a cure-all, a tool that might work in certain, certain circumstances. Right here. Just, yeah. so, so what is the ready band? What is it measuring Excellent your question. body to determine whether you're asleep and what level of sleep, whether you're deep sleep or not? Excellent question. Um, so the ready band itself is what's called an actigraph. Um, all it records is very high resolution movement. So three dimensional movement about 25 times a second to get really technical about it. It's not taking your heart rate. It's not taking any other aspects like that. The difference between this and a consumer device like a Fitbit or a Garmin or one of those things is we've actually validated the analysis of that movement against a sleep lab, against polysomnography and found, you know, it's never gonna be perfect. It's never gonna be a sleep lab, but 92% comparability. And so what that means is that when you see your sleep actually broken up and there's a period, oh, I was awake for those 10 minutes and I didn't remember it, um, it's trained against that. We've calibrated it against that. And so um, that's called actigraphy. Um, a lot of people think, oh, does it mean if I'm not moving, I'm asleep? If I'm moving, then I'm awake. It's, it's not that simple at all. In fact, if you were you know, dead uh, still and didn't move at all, it wouldn't say you're asleep. It would say, you're either dead or the band's not being worn. And it, it, would, assume, it would assume the band's not being worn. So, so that, that's one of the key differences there. Yeah. Thank you all so much. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks so much, Nick. I really appreciate it.